What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, last night, so last night I was uh, had a little bit of time, so I was looking through uh, a Reddit forum for Sparfillin 401s, and there was a gentleman who uh, posted that he was thinking about buying a 401, either a VIT or a Spart, and he had heard that there were issues with the QC, uh, there were issues with overall quality, overall reliability of these bikes, so um, even though I'm not active on Reddit too much, I felt like uh, it'd be appropriate for me to, to respond uh, to that post just with my experience. And as I got to posting, um, the list of, of issues that I have had with mine, even though they're relatively minor, are pretty long. So as I went on and on and on trying to respond to this gentleman, it uh, got me thinking, well, maybe I should should uh, post a video of this so that way I can go through at least what my experience has been with this bike over 2,000 miles um, and about eight months of ownership, seven to eight months of ownership. So here we go. And the, so the first thing I'll say is we have to remember these bikes, they are, you don't pay a lot for what you get. So you do get a lot more features, you do get a lot more performance than you do with its competitors despite it being a similar cost. So competitors would be like R3, Ninja 400, the small CBRs, that group, right? obviously the Duke 390, same thing. Um, so typically when we compare those, those motorcycles with a VIT 401, you get a lot more with the 401 for the same price, right? Especially uh, recently in the last couple of years, uh, Husqvarna has moved its, its assembly process to India, which dropped the MSRP about $1,000, right? So before they did that, I think the MSRP was 62 or 6,300 before all the other freight fees and assembly and all the other stuff. Now they're, I think they're 5,400 or something like that before all the other fees. So, you know, about an 800 to a thousand dollar difference, which on a, on an item that costs that little percentage wise is, is big. Now, when I say these, you get a lot for your money with these bikes, comparable price to its competitors. However, with these, you get fully adjustable forks at the front, fully adjustable rear suspension, Whereas normally in this class, you might get like adjustable preload at the back, but that's it. This is fully adjustable both front and rear. Has a quick shifter both up and down, which again in this class, you might get a quick shifter, but a lot of times it's only quick shifter up, not down. So um, also the, you get some kind of nice creature comforts like uh, your controls, they're all illuminated. So at nighttime, all these, controls here they're all illuminated which is a nice which is a, a super nice feature um these bikes are also they're they're pretty powerful for the displacement and for its category they make a lot of torque down low they're pretty snappy and they're also really light so these bikes um the general consensus is these bikes they're around 330 pounds or so um in the category a lot of the other bikes, like the R3, for example, wet is around 375 or so, something like that. So this is considerably lighter. And that 330 pound weight that uh, is provided by Husqvarna, that's including all the extra parts for these bikes that are easy to take off. Easy to, to take off. So for example, passenger grab handle, passenger foot pegs, um, that huge um, like fender thing at the back that has the the uh that little mud hugger and, and reflectors and this and that all the reflectors at the front the huge mirrors the skid plate at the bottom all that's included in that 330 pounds so really in reality the bike itself is more like 310 maybe even less um once you take all those those items off right so really in reality you're looking at a low 300 pound bike compared to an r3 which is more like 370 and of course you could remove weight from those as well, but not as easily as, as these bikes. So when you have a small displacement engine with that little power, that weight is gonna make a big difference. So I think we have to keep that in mind that you're getting a lot for your money. Um, so you can't expect the quality to be as good. You, you can't have it all, right? So anyway, so just kind of an overview of this bike. Some of the things that I notice about it, there's little things like, you can see this, doesn't quite sit the way it should, for example. 
Um, you can see the body work is not totally perfect, right? We have stuff like this. I think on the other side is the same. Yeah, I mean, you look at the fairings, they're not, it's not the greatest, right? So you have issues like that. I've also experienced issues with the chain quality, which is well known. Um, I've got about 2000 miles on this bike and I've had to adjust the chain three times already. And I'm not talking about adjusting it just to get the spec perfect on it. I mean, it's, it's, it'll be obviously loose, obviously way too loose. So um, at 2000 miles, I have to adjust the chain that much. It's just not, not great. Um, but that's been pretty well documented. I also, when I first got the bike, okay, so I only had a couple hundred miles on it, check engine light. Uh, luckily I have an OBD scanner, so plugged it in and the check engine was for low voltage at the O2 sensor. So I thought, okay, well, maybe at the factory there's just some uh, junk on the, on the O2 sensor or something like that. So I went ahead, unplugged it, took it out, checked all the pins, made sure none of them were bent, none of the connections were loose or anything like that. The sensor itself looked clean, didn't see any issues there. So I went ahead and uh, put the O2 sensor back in, cleared the check engine light. Uh, the light stayed off for a little while and then maybe a couple days later, check engine light again. So went ahead, did the same thing, just double checked everything, make sure I didn't miss anything, make sure there wasn't anything obviously wrong with the wires, nothing burned, nothing pinched, no assembly errors or anything like that. and. There wasn't anything. So went ahead, cleared that check engine light once more, um, and then never saw the light again. So maybe it was a fluke, I don't know, but uh, not, I mean, when you get a brand new bike with only a couple hundred miles on it, it's already get a check engine light. Uh, you know, it's not really uh, the, the greatest feeling. So another thing I noticed too, is you see the dash here. I don't know, I don't wanna to totally blame Husqvarna yet because I don't know if maybe this is assembled at the dealer. I'm not sure if that's part of the uh, assembly when the bike arrives, but as you can see, okay, so it has all these smudges in it. There's some on the outside, of course, but most of those are on the inside. So, I mean, it almost looks like, you know, everybody has that, that gross friend that spits on their glasses to clean them. That's kind of what this looks like. I'll have to get that addressed at some point when I have time, but just little things like that are kind of kind of bothersome, right? Every time I ride the bike, I have to see that. Another issue with this dash is sometimes I it doesn't comp I don't get all the functions that I'm supposed to get. So for example, I'll turn the bike on and I won't get um, the miles to empty in the center of the screen. I could either continue on without it, the tack works, everything else works, but I don't get that function. As soon as I turn the bike off, turn it back on, then that function will, will return. So I'm not sure what's up with that. Again, I'll have it addressed at, at some point, but you know, it's not gonna make you stranded, but it is kind of annoying that even a dash as simple as this, I mean, this is about as simple as you could get other than just a straight analog dash, um, does, does not work 100%. Uh, as far as, fasteners um that's kind of been an issue for me as well at least from what i've seen the fastener quality on these is is pretty poor um a lot of times when i disassemble things on this bike i've got to chase threads i've got to clean the threads up um, i don't know if that's more of an assembly issue right they're galling the threads as they're um, driving the fasteners in or if it's the quality of the fasteners i kind of think it's a little bit of both just just looking at a lot of the fasteners on this bike, they just don't, they don't really exude quality. So uh, I think it's it's maybe a little bit of both, but that's something that uh, I do notice. So if you're gonna get one of these bikes, make sure that you've got a tap and die set because you're definitely gonna be chasing some threads here and there. Um, I've had a few bolts fall out, so which that's not totally uh, out of line for motorcycles. Motorcycles, they just vibrate so much that you're, you're gonna lose fasteners sometimes. Um, so that's definitely a thing as well. I think part of that contribution is a lot of the torque specs for these bikes are very, very low. They're very low. So, I mean, we're talking, you know, some of the, the torque specs on this bike, they're 50 something inch pounds, right? So that being said, 
they it's going to be more prone to vibrating loose right because they're already not very tight uh, to, to begin with one kind of annoying issue that I have with this bike as well is I get a slight coolant leak every so often. I've taken the fairings off to see where it's coming from. It looks like it's coming from maybe the reservoir, um, but it's not a huge leak, but once in a while, I'll find a little bit of coolant kind of in this area. It'll look like it maybe dripped on the, on the, uh, on the spring, on the coil spring, and then there'll be a little bit of splash here and here. It's not much, I haven't seen it in a while, but uh, it definitely has a slight coolant leak. It's just been a couple drips, but still kind of annoying. Um, another thing to note that's just coming to mind right now is when I first got this bike, I experienced issues with stalling. So uh, in certain conditions, I noticed if I would start the bike up, not let it warm up totally, maybe just let it run for a minute or two, shut it off, turn it back on. If I tried to take off and I didn't have the RPMs up, it would stall. Uh, also coming to stoplights when I pull the clutch in, once in a while it would stall there as well. That has gone away, so I'm not sure if that was just the computer learning or something like that or just the motor loosening up. I don't know what that was, but when I first had it, I did have it stall probably half a dozen times, just kind of randomly, always fired right back up. But it definitely was, was a thing and was kind of annoying. Um, to go back to the quick shifter, I'm glad that it does come with the quick shifter up and down, but it doesn't work that great. So on mine, if I go from third to second and the RPMs are not high enough, if they're a little bit lower in the RPM, meaning maybe like below 4,000, 3,500, something like that. A lot of times what'll happen is when I go down to second, it'll be in, it'll go down to second for a period of time, a very short period of time, and it'll, it'll pop out of gear. It'll just go right to, to neutral. So um, not sure what's up with that. I don't know if it's an issue with the quick shooter need to be adjusted or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'll try to go from third to second. It'll, uh, it'll click into gear for a short period of time and then uh, all of a sudden the res will shoot right up and then I'll be in neutral. So kind of annoying, especially second gear. You're gonna use that a lot in city riding. You're gonna use that a lot when you're trying to you know, turn onto a side street. That's gonna be a gear that you're gonna use often. So it's kind of, a, kind of hazardous and kind of annoying when you are all of a sudden not in gear anymore. Yeah, guys, so that's just been my experience again. It's been about 2,000 miles, had it for about seven months or so, something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm not, it's never left me stranded. I don't, I don't, I've never worried about the bike like breaking down and I can't get home. There's just little kind of quirky annoyances with these. Um, again, I don't take it to heart too much. It is kind of a, it's an oddball item. They don't sell a lot of them. It's not a Japanese bike, so it's not going to be totally reliable. Yes, the fitment kind of sucks. Yes, the dashboard sucks. Uh, there's some mechanical issues like my quick shifter, like the stalling when I first got it, the chain, so forth, right? But again, for the same price as you would pay for its competitors, you're getting quick shifter up and down, adjustable suspension, you're getting full LEDs, you're getting LEDs at the front and at the back, which there's even a, a lot of bigger bikes, a lot of bikes that are way more expensive still don't have LEDs. Um, you're also getting a, a decent amount of performance, right? You're getting 40, I think these are 44 horse, which is pretty competitive for its class, but these engines make a lot more power down low as opposed to the parallel twin offerings. And these bikes are super light, right? So typically if you want something light, you gotta pay for it, right? You're, you're not gonna get uh, reliable, fast, and cheap all at the same time. Typically, you're usually gonna have to give up one of those things. And I think uh, for these for these bikes, you get cheap and you get good performance for, for its category. So you lose that in reliability and, and, and quality. It kind of, hey, it 
it is what it is. I mean, you can't, you can't be too mad at it. If you don't want to tinker, if you don't want to have to deal with these little annoyances, then yeah, you're probably going to be better off with an MT-03 or an R3 or something like that. Right, of course, right? Every, everybody knows that. If you want a motorcycle you never have to touch other than oil changes and adjusting the chain every so often, not three times in seven months, Yamaha's, Yamaha Honda, basically the only game in town, right? But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's not to bash these. I mean, I, I've enjoyed mine. I'm glad that I purchased this. I think it was the, the right option for me. Um, when I sit on, when I sat on uh, the other options in the category, it's just not something that, that I, I would ride. I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but I I, I just, I wouldn't ride an R3, uh, maybe for a track bike or something like that, but to commute, to get around, something that I wanna ride all the time, something I'm gonna spend a lot of time on, I I wouldn't I wouldn't wanna be on a Ninja 400 or you know maybe the, the new ZX4 RR that's coming out, maybe something like that, but that's not in the price range. Those are, those are gonna be $10,000, right? So. Anyways, guys, uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in. That's again, that's just been my experience. This is just a sample of one. Um, I know a lot of others are gonna comment later that oh, I've got ten thousand miles on mine. I've had no issues at all. I'm I'm sure I'm sure, but um, that that hasn't been my experience. So, anyways, we'll talk to you guys later. Thank you so much for for joining.